guys. Hi guys. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for to coming in event. to join uh, this event. Uh, obviously, we had this obviously project, we had this project uh, celebrating, uh, celebrating the hundred years of uh, uh, and, uh, and the profession, obviously. And, uh, it's, been and uh, it's been really a pleasure to receive all your support on this project. And, on this uh, project. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to share our experiences as engineers and within this department, within this department, listen from Ken and so on. Yeah, I think I'll just the floor to Omar to uh, introduce, uh, introduce uh, the uh, engineering uh, at Imperial. Come on. I guess we need this, right? I guess we need this, right? Yes, yes. Right, so good evening, everybody. Right, so good evening, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm uh, Omar Ratta. I'm the current head of the Department of Chemical Engineering here. Yeah. I'm welcome you all here tonight. This event should have taken place, I think, on November or something like that. I think there were lots of events that conspired against this, but I'm really happy to see you all here tonight. My belief is that this event will be a very good event. My belief is that this event will be a very good event. My belief is that this event will be a very good event. My belief is that this event will be a very good event. My belief is that this event will be a very good event. My belief is that this event will be a very good event. My belief is that this event will be a very good event. My belief is that this event will be a very good event. Just to go back in time, I'll tell you a bit about how things kind of about 100 years ago, about 100 years ago, and then bring you back to the present day. I hope that's alright. I hope that's alright. The slides are ready. The slides are ready. So, so the the big the first big event was a course that was delivered in by the way to Stephen, so he knows all the so he knows all the all the trivia, the trivia, and all the facts and all the statements. If you so Stephen, if you if you know, there's a there's an error. Please do feel free to have a drink. Maybe don't get a drink at the end of the night. So so John Hinchley delivered so John Hinchley delivered a course on plant design back in 1910, which I think kind of came out of the whole thing. And then my and then my pre 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 was William Bowen back in 1912. You can see what heads of departments used to look like back in the day. Pretty intense looking. Pretty intense looking. Pretty studious. Glasses. Glasses. Serious tash. Serious tash. Serious tie. And a serious tie. And you can just compare that with the HOD. So HOD. So evolution. I'll leave that up to you to decide. To decide. And then. I've got this really annoying timeline here, which is going to give you some of the facts there. So the first connection is actually near the start of the First World War, and so the first diploma of Imperial College Kemenge was awarded back then in 1914, and the war broke out, and so students and staff were enlisted. More effort, and in 1920, the college returned to home building was was. Uh, finished in, in 1914. You can see there's a picture of the bone building, as a picture of the bone courtyard. Uh, the doors downstairs still don't work. Uh, back in the day, I keep putting in defects, but anyway. So some things never change, but anyway, it's a bit of history there for you. Uh, between 20 and 40, the department continued to grow, and, uh, and you can see that the sort of research that we were active in back in the day I think the font size is a bit small, so I'm going to read it out to you. Coal, right? Combustion at high pressures. Combustion researchers. Uh, combustion in electrical discharges, right? So you can see what was fashionable back in the day. And I think things really have evolved over the years. Uh, and then, of course, we, we established the Kemenge Society back in 35. I, I think it was the postgraduates who established that society. And that has evolved. And uh, now we've got a society. And in, in fact, I think Chris Tai, who's sitting in the front here, is the deputy president of the Kemenge SOC. So we've got a member of staff who's the president. Now we've got the chairperson who's a student. That works really well. And it's actually my great honor to have been president of the SOC for, I think, three years. And I gave up in, in 2016. It was really good. And then, of course, we had the Second World War, 1939. When, when the department transferred to the city in, in Gills, here's the bone building again, just missed it. Uh, and then, here's another annoying timeline. Um, 1940, our first graduates in chemical engineering were awarded their degrees uh, during the war. And then the Roderick Hill buildings is where we are right now, and that was, uh, I think, finished in 1957 at the lecture theatre. So, and I believe this is the lecture theatre that we're talking about, but in fact, the predecessor of this lecture theatre was rotated 90 degrees. 
So if I, if I were talking to you in that <coughs> previous lecture theatre, I would have been standing somewhere over there, uh, and I think Ken would have been all the way down here, wouldn't have been able to see me. And so what we did when we refurbished this, we, we rotated it. It wasn't my idea. I think it's a brilliant idea. And I like to think that this is a much better lecture theatre. So in fact, we have evolved, which is terrific. So that was 1957. 1966, the ACE extension, and I was talking to Michael Green earlier. Michael, Michael was here when the, um, the 66 building ACE extension uh, opened. That's our final building. We've got three buildings, Bone, uh, Roderick Hill, and, and, and the ACE extension. ACE stands for Aeronautics and Chemical Engineering, except in 2017, Aeronautics left and, and went to join their friends, well, mortal enemies, in, in mechanical engineering in, in the southeast quadrant which left us with the conundrum, what do we call ourselves? Um, and when they moved out, the business school moved in, and computing moved in, and medicine moved in. And I mean, I think Frankenstein would, would be a good name for, for the building. There was a hodgepodge of various things there. But anyway, 66. Uh, and then I'm going to skip over a whole load of <laughs> heads of departments, including Upper Loader, who, who's, I think, known to some of you uh, in the audience, who is a historic figure uh, in our department, and his uh, assistant at that point in time, Georgina Green, who, who's uh, another historic figure, and I think Stephen remembers her quite well, uh, to uh, 1975, where I believe it's 75 rather than 73. I mean, I'm 75, okay, good, I've got the date right, thank goodness. Uh, Roger Sargent became our head of department, and Roger had, had founded the field of, of systems engineering. That was, in fact, a turning point for the department. The modern-day Kemenge, I think, was born around that sort of time, arguably. 1975. 1980 uh, was when we established our first four-year degree. And 87, we started to award Kemenge degrees for the first time. And I hope I've got all these dates correct. Stephen, if not, answers on the postcard. Thanks very much. Yes? No? OK. <laughs> Um, so, the, the final minute, just to tell you about where we are today, right? So, I'd like to think of ourselves here as a thriving department. Uh, we're multinational, multicultural, 40 different, or 40 plus different nationalities in, in the department here. We've got a, a head count of about 46 or so. Um, I, I neglected to say that I did my degree in this department, my first degree, and my incoming class was about 81. And I think only 67 of us survived in the end. But now we have 600 plus uh, undergraduates, about 150 uh, intakes. So things have evolved. And 140 or so, anyway, you could read the numbers as well as I can. So quite, quite a large uh, activity in this department on any given day before COVID. There'll be about 1,000 people milling around here in the department. And right now we're ranked number 10 in the world, although there'll be some figures that'll come out next week which will suggest that that number 10 has become a smaller number, which fills me with satisfaction. And speaking of satisfaction, I, I, I like to think that we're good at research, but we're also good at training people and training students, which is really terrific. In 2021, 20, we were ranked top of the national uh, student satisfaction uh, survey in terms of overall, overall satisfaction, which is really, really good. And I think on the note of satisfaction, I think I'll stop and I'll hand over to the next speaker. Thanks very much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much, Omar, for an excellent introduction to chemical engineering at Imperial. Can I please request Professor David Bogle, uh, current president of ICHEMI, to say a few words about chemical evolution? Thank you. Thanks very much, Amit, and thanks, uh, Omar. So the first thing I'd like to do is thank you for having us here. It's, um, it's, it's uh, great, to, great to be here. So, as Amit said, I'm David Bogle. I'm um, current president of the ICME. I'm a professor of chemical engineering of, a few miles up the road at University College uh, London, UCL. But I'm here for a couple of reasons, and actually the first reason is to thank you. Thank you all for, as volunteers, uh, to ICME, the volunteers really, you know, the, the engine that really helps to drive what we do. And uh, so I just really want to, from, on behalf of uh, ICME, to thank you all very much for all the efforts and everything that you've done. And particularly, I want to mention the, uh, the ChemEng Evolution, all the volunteers that were heavily involved in, in ChemEng Evolution, which has been a fantastic um, set of activities over the last uh, 12 months or so. Um, leading to uh, some um, really important outputs that uh, we're currently in the process of 
beginning to draft a new strategy for the next four or five years for ICME, and that will really inform the way that we're going because it's so. Uh, they, were, they were really looking forwards about how chemical engineering is growing its footprint, to, uh, involved in lots of um, n uh, the existing areas, but lots of new areas as well, and how we can grow and develop the discipline and grow and develop the number of people involved in, in chemical engineering, indeed, and grow um, the um, involvement with, with, with ICME. So thank you all very much for that. I, um, and so my, uh, oh, and uh, one extra thing I want to say about ChemEng Evolution is that one of the things we wanted to do is particularly thank the family of John Collier, who made a bequest some years ago to, uh, to the ICME and allowed us to uh, use some of that money towards uh, supporting the ChemEng Evolution activities. John Collier was a um, very significant figure in the electricity generation, particularly the nuclear industry. He was actually, as it happens, a, a graduate of UCL. <coughs> but he was um, really spent most of his life at, at Harwell, and, but particularly in the, chemical, in the um, nuclear industry, ended up in the, U uh, well, actually, I think most of his career was in the UK Atomic Energy Authority and helped to uh, develop that for privatisation and then he was ended up as chair of uh, the uh, UK AEA as it was and then became chair of Nuclear Electric and then he was um, ICME president in 95 I believe and died in office rather tragically at the age of 60 so uh, some of the money from uh, from his estate came to the ICME and we were able to repurpose it for um, for, uh, for the Cambridge evolution. So that's my first job, is to thank you all very much. And my second job then is to uh, introduce our speaker, Ken Rivers, who was um, uh, ICME president. Ooh, I wrote it down. Uh, I knew I'd forget. <laughs> uh, if I don't write it down, if I don't... 2018-19, um, uh, 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 but spent pretty much all of his career in Shell, <coughs> Uh, safety written through him like a stick of rock <coughs> and of course that's what we're going to be uh, going, going to be hearing about today um, uh, and uh, I think he spent uh, as I say most of his time in Korea ending up as um, head of all the refinery operations and then spent uh, a rather difficult time I'm sure in New Zealand <laughs> Uh, before uh, then retiring, coming back and has a number of uh, non-executive roles, obviously at one stage uh, ICME uh, trustee and uh, president, but for he was heavily involved in the Bunsfield inquiry, now involved in the Grenfell um, building regulations reform and, and so on, so heavily involved in safety and I think that's what Ken is going to talk about us today. Ken, over to you. <laughs> Uh, oh, I've got to, <coughs> sorry, I've got to plug the technology in. Um, can we get to the present? Nobody introduced me to the uh, to the slides. Oh, sorry, oh, we're just doing that. Right, cool. While, while they're doing that, can I maybe just say, look, it's, um, it's uh, a real pleasure to be here this evening um, to join in this centenary uh, event. I think to celebrate, communicate and inspire, which is what the evolution process has been all about, about the contribution that chemical engineering and chemical engineers have made to society. And especially this evening to recognise and to celebrate the work of volunteers without whom none of this would have been possible. Tonight we're going to be focusing on process safety. I'm going to talk about it in a little bit broader terms. I'm going to be talking about managing major hazards and about the work chemical engineers and chemical engineering has done to avoid, mitigate and evade those events that can kill, maim and wound people, that can do catastrophic damage to the environment, that generate huge economic cost and disruption and can destroy 
communities and business. That's the nature of the topic we're going to be talking about tonight. And it's about how a league of extraordinary engineers have helped to avoid catastrophe. And I'm going to talk about the journey that we were on to reach to today's situation. I'm also going to then touch on the future challenges that we face. Unlike what you might be expecting, I'm not just going to talk about the science of chemical engineering, but I'm going to talk about its application, the art, if you like, of chemical engineering, how we take that scientific knowledge and put it into practice as the rubber hits the road of reality. I'm not going to just be talking about the hard skills and techniques, I'm going to be talking about the soft skills and techniques. I'm going to be going beyond the technical and the engineering to the, be, to the behavioural organisation and even philosophical contribution that this league of extraordinary engineers has contributed to. Gosh, so here we are, a league of extraordinary engineers. For the last 12 years now, I've started every presentation that I've made right around the world with this slide. And it's about an extraordinary situation. This is New Zealand, or was New Zealand's only oil refinery. It is situated in one of the most pristine sites in the whole of the world. The whales in the Pacific spend their time in summer, sorry, in winter, in the breeding grounds of the tropics around Polynesia and Fiji and Tahiti and places like that. But as the winter changes to summer, so they migrate southwest till they hit New Zealand. And then they track along the coast till they go to their summer grounds in the Antarctic. And this is the place where the whales hit New Zealand. It's called Whangarei, the meeting place of the whales. It is one of the most pristine environments. Whales, dolphins, incredible fish swim there. On the beaches, shellfish can be gathered, all in the close proximity of an industrial facility that could create catastrophe. What an extraordinary achievement, and chemical engineers have been part of delivering that. I want to touch on this about systems, because I know David is really keen on systems, and systems were what inspired me to become a chemical engineer. I, I was faced with a, an even simpler box of stuff in, uh, when I was studying uh, chemistry uh, uh, at school, and they were saying, well, you know, we've got this combination of chemicals, they're going to go through a process, not all the chemicals are going to get converted into what we need, so we could send some of it back to the beginning and reprocess it. And I said, that sounds really, really interesting. So how do you decide how much you send back? Because surely the more stuff you send back, the more energy you've got to do to push it through. And this pipe gets bigger and that reactor gets huge. And so how do you resolve all of that? Chemistry teacher said, well, I think somebody called chemical engineers do that. And that's what hooked me into it. That's what inspired me on this journey. And uh, later on, of course, when I went into the oil and gas business, I, I understood that those systems were just part of an even bigger system, half the size of Chester. But then, of course, I realised it was part of an even bigger picture about provision of energy in a sustainable and safe way to meet the needs of society and the economy in a way that's practical, realistic and is deliverable. 
Wow. Envelopes within envelopes within envelopes. Small boxes to bigger boxes to even bigger boxes. Changing the nature of the conversation. Changing the picture of the solution. Brilliant. Extraordinary. But the reason when I talk about managing major hazards and I'm talking about extraordinary is because of this matrix. It's called a risk matrix and some of you will be very familiar with them. Um, basically what it says is the consequences that we're talking about relatively small at the top, relatively large at the bottom. Okay. The frequency of those incidents, rare over here on the left, very, very frequent on the right. And most of the work that we do in chemical engineering is in the top right hand corner, where cause and effect are obvious and evident. I turn you know, the, the gas supply on the furnace up and the temperature of the stuff coming out at the back end goes up. Cause and effect is obvious. But the area we're talking about is the extraordinary events that take place in the very rare but very high consequence space. And that's why I say a league of extraordinary engineers dealing with extraordinary events that have developed some of the most extraordinary thinking to deliver success. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the journey that we've been on and how we can manage future challenges. Okay? And during the course of that, of course, we come across some extraordinary people. Um, as a past president of the Institution of Chemical Engineers, I was asked who inspired me. Well, this guy inspired me, a guy called Trevor Kletz. I always remember the first time I met Trevor. Uh, I just joined Shell and there'd been an incident called Bunsfield which had made a big bang and explosion and shocked everybody and Shell decided that they need somebody to think about preventing that sort of thing. And I was sent off by train up to Teesside to visit ICI where Trevor Kletz and his team worked. And what an amazing man. It was a truly jaw-dropping experience to go in and listen to what Trevor said about the eye-watering array of potential disasters that the facility I was operating could submit to. About the potential chaos that could exist and how that chaos could be converted into an orderly and structured management process to resolve it. And to understand the chronic unease and worry didn't have to be disabling. It could be motivating and engaging and energizing. This guy was a true pathfinder and he was He's inspired me and a bunch of other chemical engineers to grasp the difficult challenges of managing major hazards. He shone a light on those events about how they can be mapped, mitigated and managed. And those insights are now being grasped beyond the process industries. For example, in the building sector, post Grenfell. So let's explore this journey. For many of us, the first incident and event on this was Flixborough. Yeah? Some smiles in the audience. There was a reactor and it had to be taken out of service and there wasn't a bypass. So a couple of engineers got together, so I did to put a bit of pipe over here, a bit of pipe over there, and stuff a bit of pipe in there. And when they started up, it blew up. <laughs> Shock. All despair. Catastrophe. But we learned from it. 
We learnt something about the management of change, which I think percolates right through all our education processes and right through our businesses at the moment. The, I mean, the next incident that came along was Seveso, which was not too long after. Um, interesting, Seveso led to a change in the way we legislate and regulate major hazards about enabling goal-setting legislation. And indeed, it wasn't too long ago, probably about five years ago, that I was involved in implementing Seveso 3, which was the Europeans' latest update on the legislative programme. So that still goes back and is relevant to today. And we learned from it. And then, of course, Bhopal in 1984. Oh, my goodness me, what a shock. Big wake-up call recognition that when you have these events, they can actually impact on the communities around you. And the implications and consequences of Bhopal have still not been fully mitigated in India. It was a wake-up call because the standards and processes that could have been put in place to prevent this incident existed within the company that did it. They just didn't apply them in India because they didn't have to. Oversimplification, I know, but a recognition already that we knew some of the reasons why these things were happening, but we weren't implementing them. And so we go later, and Stephen, you know a lot about Piper Alpha, but it's, it's again an example where people from Imperial College have made really groundbreaking contributions to incidents when they have come along and grasp the learning to be applied not just in that particular circumstance but applied across industry. And I move on, Texas City in 2005. Much closer to home, Bunsfield. Moving on, Deepwater Horizon in 2010. And again, Fukushima in 2011 and Beirut in 2020. I could go on and on and on. I think this is the 125th example of an ammonium nitrate explosion that has occurred. After each of these incidents, we have learned something. We now know what to do to prevent a catastrophic incident occurring on a process site. We know. Why? Because we've had an incident where we've learned those lessons. And those lessons have been turned into good practice. And that good practice is available. And yet the incidents keep happening. So what's going on? Judith Hackett, Dame Judith Hackett, also a, um, sorry David, uh, like you, a, a, a graduate of Imperial College, um, has some ideas. And Judith is a real stimulus in this area. Judith has been chair of the health and safety executive. She led the Chemical Industries Association. She has more recently uh, been involved in the review of building and fire regulations uh, post Grenfell contributions that chemical engineers are making in these spaces. But her analysis is there are new, new accidents, just different people making the same mistakes because of a failure to recognise the relevance of that learning and of other people's experiences and therefore not learning and therefore the learning's not applied and therefore the incidents keep happening. And one of the interesting things about Dame Judy's insight on this is promoting a discussion of the what to the why. I was just at a conference last week uh, presenting on this issue. The majority of the people there were talking about improving the techniques to improve the what. And now we can do more of the what and that will solve the problem. But actually the reality is we need to do more in the why space. And let me give you just two examples. I was operating a major industrial complex. 
we were having a cascade of near misses that could have led to catastrophe. And it was about the fact we weren't following the operating instructions. Now, the operating instructions weren't perfect. They never are. But in this case, we weren't following them. And because we weren't following them, incidents were happening. And what we did was game-changing. Beside every instruction, we wrote a line that explained why we wanted you to move the temperature set point from 36 degrees to 68 degrees. You need to do that because. Or you need to do that because if you don't, something nasty is going to happen. All of a sudden, people are then confronted with, I want you to do this, and I know the reason for it. And it was game changing. The number of faults that we had in the operating instructions, the number of not following improved, compliance improved. But what it also did was stimulate a discussion about the existing operating instructions say, well, I know, Ken, you want to do this because you want to achieve that, but actually there's a better way of doing it, or what you're asking me to do won't do it. And it then stimulated a discussion. So more about the why. The other one relates to safety and was as profound. A lot of you involved in safety will start the day talking to your people about the importance of safety and what needs to be done. You probably then spend the rest of the day talking about how the plant needs to be kept in operation, the yields need to be up and the throughput's got to increase from where it is. And we have accidents. We did something game-changing. So instead of talking to people at the beginning of the day about what we wanted them to do, we went round to see them at the end of the day. And we asked them, why were you safe today? Why didn't you have an accident? And that was surprising because they were going, that's a bit of a different question. I uh, don't know about that. And of course, the first couple of weeks when you're going out and doing that, you sort of get... Mwah. But after a while, people then got in their head that at the end of the day, they were going to see their boss or their supervisor, and he was going to ask and explore them how they'd managed to be safe all day. And they started to think about what they needed to do to be safe during the day. And the incident rate plummeted more on the why, less on the what. OK? Good. Um, so let's talk about, a little bit if we can, the journey that we've been on. And we start in a box in the left-hand corner called unconscious incompetence. The, the world is beautiful. The sun is shining. It's not raining. There's not a cloud in the sky. I'm going out with some friends for dinner tonight, and I'm really looking forward to it. And then, oh, catastrophe. One of those incidents happened. Okay? And I realize that I'm unconsciously incompetent. And that catast catastrophic incident tells me I'm consciously incompetent. I need to do something. Now, of course, chemical engineers have helped. You don't need to have a catastrophe anymore. You could take a measurement. We take a measurement. And we take a measurement, it's not as we expected. And we know we're not, that we know we're over here. Or we take a measurement and it's a good measurement, and then we take another measurement. And instead of it going better, it's got worse. Oh, I've got a problem. Or I take a measurement, it's a good measurement. I take another measurement, it's even better. I come back and it's even better. And then I benchmark against a comparable site and find I'm 10 times worse than everybody else. Those are the areas where chemical engineers have really, really helped to move things forward. What are the mechanisms by which we can understand we've got a problem? And then, of course, once we're consciously incompetent, we move to a place of how do I become consciously competent? What are the things that I need to do to make sure I don't have these incidents? 
What are the things I need to do to make sure those key parameters move in the right way? What is it I've got to do to make sure that while they're moving in the right day, they benchmark against others? Processes, systems, procedures, a lot of the engineering technical stuff is here in this space. And we move to a book called Conscious Competence. Then, of course, it's about internalising that and, and making those procedures, those systems part of just how we do business. And the problem is, unconscious incompetence and unconscious competence are remarkably the same. Because the garden is beautiful, the grass is green, the flowers are growing, there are no weeds. And so often when I go and I talk to um, industry leaders about their state of their business, they tell me how unconsciously competent they are. Top right hand box, Ken. We are doing great. So I check their thinking. Two questions. First question. All right, so you're doing really, really well. How about if I come and do an audit <laughs> in two weeks' time to see how you're doing? Yeah, great, Ken. We'll do that. Next week, I'll go around, I'll do a quick check, make sure this is in place, that's in place, that's in place. Yeah, and then you can come and see how good I am. So actually, you don't want me to audit your current reality. You want me to audit something that you have a special go at. And I get a puzzled look. And I said, look, an external audit is a win-win. If you are really unconsciously competent, an external audit is a win-win. Why? Because somebody is going to come in and have an independent look at it. And if they find nothing is wrong, great. You're doing a fantastic job. You've got everything in place. But if they do find something, they're telling you about how you can improve your business. Which is a win as well, isn't it? And it's based around a real reality about what actually is going on, not something special that you just have to have nudged because you know something's happening. And the other question I asked them is quite a simple one. There are other incidents in your industry. Do you know about them and what can you learn from them? Often they say, well, I don't know about those other incidents. And I say, well, shouldn't you? And if they do know about other incidents that are taking place, in their industry, then the other question I ask is, so tell me what 73 Spoing 737 Max incident tells you about your business and how you need to improve. Those two questions can be game changing uh, for organisations. So this business about unconscious competence and unconscious incompetence being linked important that we learn about audit, learning from others, and to this mindset of chronic and ease and a mindset shift. The other bit is about how chemical engineers has moved us down the iceberg. Now, uh, moving us down the iceberg uh, during a period of climate change, um, I presume is a pretty relevant uh, example, I suppose, is that we've got to keep this iceberg going. Um, but at the top is where we often as engineers spend a lot of the time about at the event level. So for example, if you look at Texas City or look at Bunsfield, at the event level, we investigate what has gone wrong. And if we put it right, then we can prevent that particular event happening for those particular reasons. And that's all. We're focused on, did the operator do the right thing? Was there a piece of equipment failure? Were the procedures right? It's about what happened and what can we put it like. It's reactive. Later on, of course, we can come down further and look at the pattern and trends 
and see what's been occurring here. We start to see that these sorts of events are arising during startups and shutdowns, right? So they're patterns and trends, so we can start to anticipate. Chemical engineers then take us even further down into systems and instructions. What are the forces at play? The fact that people are often overloaded. There are some non-routine events happening. Supervision is overworked and can no longer provide that overview of what's going on. And we can start to predict. But the area where we can make the biggest difference, mindset. What is the prevailing thinking that has been going on that has caused this to happen? And if you can get that sorted, you can deliver transformational change. So what is the mindset shift that would have prevented Bunsfield, Texas City, and a whole host of other incidents? Let me give you what it might be. That it is okay in an emergency to release flammable, explosive, or toxic gases into the environment. Because if you don't do that, then you won't get those incidents. That would be a mindset shift. Now, I'm not saying Shell, the company I work for, is as, as, as far along this as, as they needed to be. But it was six months after Texas City when I got an email from the head office saying, Ken, could you please look at your facility and list all the connections you've got to the atmosphere that can release material from the process? And can you review those and see if you can eliminate them? Those are the sorts of transformational change that chemical engineers can deliver. So now I'm going to talk about Bunsfield, if I may. And I'm, I'm running a little bit difficult because I've not got the time in front of me. Am I OK? Yeah. OK, cool. Bunsfield took place in December 2005. I was talking to David about the precise phone call that I got at 7 o'clock that morning and uh, what I went through. This was a petrol tank that overfilled and exploded. And it was a complete shock to the industry. It's a complete shock to the regulator. It's a complete shock to people to see something like that happening. And not just to those who lived around Bunsfield, but to the many people who looked out of their kitchen window that afternoon and saw a facility that looked like Bunsfield and started to wonder whether it was going to blow up. It was not expected that a petrol tank overflowing would blow up. Catch a light, create big black smoke, yeah, but not blow up. And of course, everybody committed to making sure that we never did this again. And a major incident investigation board was set up to look at the incident, investigate what was going wrong, and give some recommendations. Problem, of course, with that is trying to find out what went wrong is a bit difficult because most of the evidence had blown up. Industry was really uncomfortable with the delay in finding out what it needed to do. The regulator was under incredible pressure to do something. Just do something. And people were really concerned. Now, the normal way in which we handle these things is that when we have an incident, the regulator goes off, finds out what they believe has gone wrong, and makes proposals and tells industry what to do. It looks like this. You've all got to put double fluffy widgets on your site. 15 love. Industry turns around and goes, 
double fluffy widgets don't work. 15 all. Regulator comes around and said, they do if they're blue and purple. 30, 15. Industry says, can we make that white and black? What I'm trying to get across is a lot of the energy that is available gets diverted into this tennis match uh, between industry and regulator. And we recognised as we were going through Bonnersfield that this could not work. We were in crisis. And three mindset changes came along. The first was aligned but not joined, that regulator and industry understood that we were aligned around preventing another Bunsfield incident, but we weren't joined in terms of what we needed to do. So that was step one. Step two was that industry needed to work together. So this wasn't just a problem for Texaco and Chevron, it was a problem for the whole of the oil industry. That the regulators needed to work together. This wasn't just a job for the HSC, and the environmental agency did something else, and the Scottish Environmental Protection Authority did something else, and the Welsh Action... No, no. They needed to work together. And then, industry and regulator working together had to work together. And we delivered magic. Within 12 months we delivered a set of changes. And we only were able to do that because of this last step. We didn't know what went wrong with Bunsfield, but we did know what needed to go right. We knew that already. We didn't need any more evidence. So what we did is we looked at what needed to go right, we checked the system for gaps, we fill those gaps and then we all committed to do it. So within 12 months, full system of recommendations over 200 million pounds worth of investment was approved to address the Bunsfield issues. It showed that industry and regulator could work together to deliver real change. It shifted industry's mindset from done to us, disciplined by the regulator, held to account, dependent on others, to a place where we do it to ourselves. It's about self-discipline. It's about talking adult adult to the authorities rather than parent child and about a collaborative approach. The fundamental change of Bunsfield has led to transformation beyond this. It's led to a mindset in the UK where we are going to avoid being battered by incidents. Where we look at what's gone wrong again. Where compliance, we've done all we can to a vision-led approach, applying best practice and what needs to go right, and chronic on ease, and a realisation that there is always more to do. Industry and regulator got together and agreed where they wanted to get to. This is one of six points, but this is the highest. A thriving, safe and sustainable sector with a regulatory regime that supports business growth, high standards and strong compliance. You might all nod and agree. It wasn't easy. What's business signing up to high standards and strong compliance? What's the regulator doing saying it's going to support business growth? It's not naturally what we are here to do. But actually, through that building and pooling of our knowledge, creating a common objective, and then using all the energy we've got, we have delivered incredible change. Now, one of the most interesting things, of course, is, is if you want to develop a thriving, safe and sustainable sector, da, 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 what is the main challenge to deliver that? What is the main thing we've got to do? And it harps back to Judith's message. We've got to make good practice common practice. I'm going to go beyond where we normally get to, which is we've got to share the learning and share the learning. No. We've shared that learning. We've translated that learning into best practice. It's just a question about why are we not doing it? 
And so the issues of that, which is the biggest challenge we've got, isn't about the technical. It's about how do you engage with people who don't realize they've got a problem, get them engaged, and then help them with the tools that we've got. That is the biggest challenge, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, within that, the most important thing is leadership, because leaders make a difference. Apart from there's a big problem. Now, chemical engineers, I, I look to my very close mentor here, Stephen. Um, I think there's about 20,000 books written about thermodynamics. <laughs> and everyone says the same thing. There are 20,000 books written about leadership, and they all say something different. <laughs> so what we did post-Bunsfield is we got a group together of industry and regulator, and we defined what good leadership in major hazard management looked like. And it's this. Process, safety, standards, group. Those principles, ladies and gentlemen, are now enshrined in UK legislation. There is a book called A Good Practice Guide, which tells you what good leadership looks like. It gives examples about what you would see in an organisation that did that. And it's a book that the HSC and EA assessors use when they come into your organisation to check whether your leadership is in the right space. Now we need to apply all that learning and all that understanding into the emerging challenges. Decarbonisation and the energy transition, climate change adaptation, the impact of the pandemic, the opportunities for digitalization, and the fact that there's something called cross-sector learning. That just as we in the process sector can help the building sector with issues like Grenfell, so Grenfell and the learning in the building sector, we can learn from ourselves. Help to keep us unconsciously competent provide that continuing benchmark. And of course, within that, of course, artificial intelligence and big data, we really, really need help in understanding in order for it to deliver benefits. We were talking before dinner about actually one of the things that we struggle with with artificial intelligence is understanding why the solution that's been put forward has been generated. Uh, what are the reference authorities that build into it and what's the logic that leads you to that conclusion. And that's really important because in a lot of areas like law and uh, medicine, we need to understand the why. We also need to understand it uh, in the field of, of major hazard management. And of course, there's some issues here, which is one of the things that I, I heard from the British Society for Computing was that if you don't understand that, what you do is you miss some really important issues, like there is bias within artificial intelligence. For example, depending on your ethnic ethnicity, so facial recognition and stuff is either 95, 96% or is down in the high 60%. Why? Because of unconscious bias within the systems that they've got. Show some big issues here, but also some huge opportunities. My last but one slide. Is it okay? Okay. Much of what I've said today about mindset shift applies to organizations, companies, professions. But it also can make a profound difference to us as individuals. And I want if I may, just to pick a couple out. Where shall I start? Where am I in this? Where am I in this? 
So the story is a friend of mine. He became a site manager of a major Canadian petrochemical plant. Um, he hadn't run a site before, so he was flown off to Los Angeles to do a little bit of um, senior management training uh, to prepare him for the job. Uh, and while he was there, it was a Friday night, uh, he got a call saying that we've just had a release of 300 tonnes of LPG. It formed a cloud and it narrowly missed the office block where over 500 people were working. And his reaction was, and I understand this has been filmed so I can't say what he actually did say, um, but what the heck is going on in this organisation? What have I inherited? Am I managing fools and incompetent people? And he went to bed that night, cross, frustrated and angry. And he woke up the following morning, ready to fly uh, up from Los Angeles to uh, Calgary. And over breakfast, he realised he got it completely wrong. Because it's where am I in this? What is it that I did that contributed to this incident? Was there some signal that had been sent that I didn't respond to? Did I say something that could have contributed to it happening? Or did I not do something which contributed to what happened? It is now the first question I ask whenever I have been running a site and I have had an incident and it's changed my life. Changed my life and it has changed my effectiveness as a leader. The second was speaking another language. Um, I, um, I wasn't bright enough to come to Imperial College. Um, I, I really wanted to come here but I was told um, that I probably would have to work a little bit harder than I was used to and therefore, therefore I probably should go somewhere else. Um, so coming back and actually lecturing at Imperial College is a real... Anyway, so I hope I'm not incompetent today, I hope I've met the standard, but we'll probably hear that in the feedback. Okay, all right. <laughs> But w with that in mind, I, I was working for Shell and, and I kept coming up with these really, really good ideas and Shell didn't respond. And it kept happening and happening and happening and I was thinking of maybe there's a need to resign and just go somewhere else. Shell clearly... Oh. And then very fortunately I had a boss and um, he said to me, well, what's the problem? Can I said, well, look, I've got this column and I want to increase the inlet temperature by five degrees. And nobody's listening! And he said, okay, let me help. So what? So just ask yourself, so what? Well, if I increase the inlet temperature of the column by five degrees, more stuff will go over the top and less will go down to the bottom. So what? Well, the stuff going over the top is petrol and the stuff going through the bottom is fuel oil. Uh, and? Uh, so what? Well, petrol's worth more than fuel oil and if we do this, we'll make three million pounds a year. Ah! So one of the issues that we've got to do as we look at how are we going to influence people, how are we going to get the uninitiated to engage, is to understand the language that they speak and make the case to do it in a language that they can hear and understand. And the last thing is that we can all take part in better conversations. So, um, and this is, this is it. More diverse inputs lead to better conversations. Better conversations lead to better analysis. Better analysis leads to better decisions. And better decisions lead to better outcomes. So how is it that we can encourage and engage with more people 
to get their views and ideas on these extraordinary challenges. And the Institution of Chemical Engineers has done a huge amount. It brings people together. It brings people together to advance chemical engineering's contribution worldwide for the benefit of society. It brings people together to increase their capability, understanding of the issues so they can provide better solutions. It is led by members. It supports members in building that knowledge so they can serve society better. And we work on the issues of competence and capability of our individual members to do that. <coughs> and we do much more. Not only do we help chemical engineers to deliver more within their workplaces, but we give chemical engineers the opportunity and a voice <coughs> to deliver change. More diverse inputs lead to better conversations, lead to better analysis, lead to better conclusions, lead to better outcomes. So basically our members can contribute to change at a <laughs> policy level, at an industry level, and at a professional level. So not only are we supporting their competence, but we are providing the opportunity for them to help shape the future. And we do that through Major Hazards Committee, the Safety Centre, the Special Interest Groups, the Membership Groups, the Journals, the Hazard Conferences, and also in our contribution and working with other professional institutions like the Mechanical Engineers, the IET, and the Civils and the Hazards Forum, and the Royal Academy of Engineering. That is what the Institution of Chemical Engineers tried to do, bring people together to facilitate responding to these extraordinary challenges. My final words from Fangarai Bay to you. Ko ahatiki ke kero amai ki kura e haru tanu he tino nu rawa o mahi ki kura he hamani nu tunu See how I changed when I said those words. Those words were in Maori. They're a warrior language and they mean something. On the edge of Fangarai Bay at the meeting place of the whales, we have come too far not to go further. We have done too much not to do more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken, for a wonderful insight. Uh, we can take some questions from the audience. Oh, do I need the mic? Oh, my <laughs> Right, no, it's okay. I'm not nervous. Uh, Ken, um, very interesting point about, um, if I recall correctly, you call it Judas Hackett. Um, it's it's not about the, the it's not about new accidents. It's about people, new people, not learning uh, the old accidents. Would you agree? And um, whether you agree or not, would you comment on? Would a succinct sentence uh, of that be, and you quoted Trevor Clyde's, um, no corporate memory? Because obviously, if there is a corporate memory, then the new people, hopefully, would latch into their corporate memory and know the lessons and so on. And um, my understanding is you could maybe even, that, even make that bigger and take a corporate memory that was learned at Piper Alpha, Pass it to the people at Bhopal, Bhopal, pass it to people at Bunsfield, and I might have got the order wrong there, but if you catch my drift, would, would that be a global corporate memory? So any, any comments on that? If, if you follow my thinking there, Thank can you? you? Thanks. I, I think one of the difficulties we have, and I go back to Judy's message, we keep having accidents from causes that we know about 
with best practice that exists and we don't apply them in situations where they're needed. And I think you could talk about the words corporate memory, I mean, that would be really great, but I'd like to get a bit deeper than that. Because it's only there, so why don't we have corporate memory? What is it about people who know they've got a problem, who know the best practice, and then don't apply it? But that's only part of the problem. Because they know it all and they're not applying it. So I would come back to the issue of why don't we do it continuously, comprehensively uh, um, and consistently enough. But there's a whole group of people out there who don't even realise they've got a problem. And I mean, if you look at the number of coma sites we have in the UK, coma is <coughs> control of major accident hazards. Uh, it sets a threshold for particular extra regulation that people need to apply to. Of the 900 coma sites that we have in the UK, only between five and 600 are engaged intimately in terms of addressing these issues. So there's 400 sites out there that don't have corporate memory, don't believe they've got a problem, or if they do believe they've got a problem, think it's somebody else's problem. And if they do believe it's a problem um, and they've got a problem, they believe somebody else should solve it, they don't need to do it. Or, well, we only need to know it when the regulator comes and taps on our shoulders because otherwise we just get on and do what we're doing anyway. There's a whole raft of issues out there about why are people who are faced with major accident hazards not aware of it? If they are aware of it, why aren't they doing enough about it? If they are aware and they are doing enough about it, why aren't they doing it consistently, persistently and comprehensively enough? A whole raft of issues. And the issue for me is that none of those, ladies and gentlemen, are technical. It's about leadership, it's about behaviour, it's about organisational effectiveness. Chemical engineers are doing a tremendous amount in the technical area, but they also are doing a tremendous amount in this behavioural, organisation and philosophical area. Because that is as important, and in fact, if you listen to Judith Hackett's words, Dame Judith Hackett's words, they are even more important if we are going to be effective. In the UK, industry and regulator agree that the biggest challenge in terms of major, major accident hazards is making existing good practice common practice. And it's not simple. And that's one of the challenges we've got ahead. The other challenge, of course, is that there's new dimensions that we need to get after. And how do we do that? I mean, one of the interesting challenges, ladies and gentlemen, is, is that in the UK, with respect to coma legislation, which is major hazard legislation, it's based on quantity. So if you've got, I don't know, several thousand tonnes of this, you're a coma site. If you've got three tonnes of hydrogen, you're a coma site. But what about the number of batteries? Or the issue of rotating, you know, batteries and, 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 and what about, you know, in, in carbon capture issues and things like that. What, what about in, you know, other areas where quantity of chemicals isn't, what's going to be the parameter of what a major hazard is? How are we going to get ahead around that? How are we going to get ahead around, for, for example, hydrogen? A particular topic that really interests me. Why? Because I remember, I don't remember, but I recognise that an, an incident relating to an airship in, was it 1929? Hindenburg. The Hindenburg disaster prevented airships ever becoming a means of transportation, which they could have been and very effective. The worry is if hydrogen goes wrong, it'll be castized and put out of the equation when we need to do it. And the issue we face, ladies and gentlemen, is I've worked with hydrogen all my life. Chemical engineers have worked with hydrogen for over 150 years. I only allowed highly experienced operators working in very controlled environments to do anything with hydrogen. And the pressures we're talking about there were about 10 or 20 bars. We're talking about 100 bar hydrogen 
been used by people who have got no training in a public space which is not regulated. How do we solve that problem? Really good, really exciting. What a challenge ahead. Gosh, I wish I was still active in this space rather than having moved from being a practitioner to uh, some sort of professional mastery um, to, to a has-been. Uh, on my way, I think, Stephen, to a never was. But, you know, I think you've got a wonderful opportunity here. Do grasp it. Do move forward. And, and my applause to you. You are a league of extraordinary engineers. Okay. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, you didn't reference the aviation industry. Now, I do a bit of glider flying. Sorry, and we sorry, sorry. Did I talk about Boeing 737 MAX? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think you'll find I'm coming to another area sure, of, of discussion. Uh, it, it might be of interest to everybody in the room that after every accident, there's a so-called AAIB uh, report and all these reports do not just deal with what happened they deal with why for example could a 35 year experienced engineer put the wrong bolts in a windscreen which came out of a BAC 111 flying from Birmingham in uh, I think it was 1993 and that explores also the corporate culture I just say that to, to everybody in the room they're available on the internet and you can learn an awful lot about the human factors behind the accident, as well as the very ordered way in which the accident report has been laid out. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. And I, I look at the aviation industry, which has got very mature, um, I, I think probably exceptionally mature, um, framework within which incidents can be reported, which encourage people to report them and for learning to be grasped and it to be recycled. I think about the issues of the rail industry, how after Ladbroke Gove they have moved into a completely different space. I think about the medical industry and the journey that they have been on uh, in terms of moving their mindset into a completely different space to prevent the catastrophe of, for example, leaving pieces of equipment inside a human body after they've done an operation. People have moved landmarks moving forward. And I think, I think the point you're making is sometimes we close our minds to the learning that exists in other sectors. Often because we feel we've, through all those instances, learnt it already. But actually, we need that prompt. Just maybe we haven't. We need to keep being alert to those instances that are happening in other sectors so that we can assure ourselves that what we're doing today is good enough for today and what we might do better tomorrow. Thank you. Is there any further questions? Um, well, firstly, I'd like to say um, You've given me a, an amazing insight. Um, I've spent 15 years working in Germany, and one thing that's different about the, the British and the German attitude to instructions is that if you give instructions to a German, they will absolutely follow them. And if you give instructions to a British person, they will mostly follow them, but at some level, they'll start interpreting. And I love the idea that you've got, you know, as well as the instruction, you also write why you need to do it. And that's been a, a revelation, so thank you very much for that. My question is that um, the firm I used to work for, um, very much um, into um, sort of uh, Excel spreadsheets with lots of questions on them, and they were absolutely brilliant at getting people from, you know, organisations such as this, you know, who were bright, inquiring, capable, and turning them into people who weren't, frankly. And they, all they did, wanted to do, was just tick boxes. Um, one of the things that they, they would say was, you know, um, a scarcity mindset. Hmm. And I don't 
believe that you can ha you can actually um, look at at uh, safety and have a scarcity mindset. I think the two things it, it it's dangerous. And my question really was, how do you get people to um, to accept the the sort of lists of things that you need to do, but at the same time keep that inquiring mind so that they actually do the common sense stuff? Yeah. I, and I think that's a, a really insightful comment. Um, the legislative framework that exists around the world, you can almost say falls into two buckets. One is a very prescriptive compliance tick box type approach, and the other is the enabling legislation goal, goal setting piece. Um, and there is an intense debate going on in a number of countries uh, about that. Um, I was in New Zealand during the time when they had the Pike River mine disaster, horrific event. And um, talking to um, very senior leaders within the New Zealand government about what do we do about that? Uh, and the consensus from the business community was you need to look at either the UK or the state of Victoria and Australia at the enabling legislation that they've got, which is goal setting which essentially is a framework which says you might have ticked all the boxes, you might have ticked all the boxes, but you've got to demonstrate to me that you understand the risks that you're running, that you know how to manage those risks, and that you can demonstrate those measures take you down to as low as reasonably practical. So you can tick every box in the room, but if you can't demonstrate that, not really interested. So I think goal setting legislation can be really, 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 really helpful. The problem with goal setting legislation is, of course, it requires a lot of regulatory framework around it and, and an enabling regulator who can help and support people to do it. It requires the fact that industry pick up the ownership and go with it. Um, and sometimes if you don't pick the ownership and go with it, you've got to start off with a set of compliance things that force you to do it. You know, because I think, I think the, the journey you go on is, um, you know, the world's fantastic and then all of a sudden I'm unconsciously incompetent and I need to do that, otherwise the regulator's going to hit me over the head with a stick. And that is about compliance. You need to do that because if you don't know. What then happens, of course, is you mature, is you understand that by doing it, it gives benefit to your business. In which case you then accept ownership and therefore a goal setting, if you like, regulatory framework can work. Later on, it gets beyond that to the stage where actually cooperating and working together is that it's not just me doing it but it's all doing it which I think is where we get to in the UK where actually regulator and industry decide what's important and decide on the action plan implement the action plan and review whether it's effective or not so I think there's a maturity shape that you go through that and certainly tick boxing on compliance a lot of that has had to be in place to get people to take responsibility. Having said that, the building sector, which Post Grenville, Dame Judith Hackett went through a review of, um, said that it was complying. In large part it complied because it paid somebody to say they were complying. And when they got a piece of paper saying that they needed that they had complied, they weren't very curious about it, either because they didn't understand the piece of paper that they got or they said, well, if they've told me it's okay, it's okay. And so Dame Judith has got to say, well, actually, the problem we've got in building sector is actually it's the mindset we've got to change. It's the culture we've got to change. We've got to get to that maturity where we understand that it's our problem. We understand that we need to understand the risks. We understand the means by which we can control those risks. And we will manage those risks to as low as we usually be practical and we'll demonstrate that. So it's a, it, it is a real issue, but tick boxes is 
part of the journey, I think, we've got to go on. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ken. Th thanks again. Okay. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I think the uh, most important thing is we could see so many people in face to face. Uh, after the last year cancellation. So thank you so much for making to this event, for your all contribution to the uh, Cambridge Evolution event, and thank you to all the presidential team. Uh, thanks to the Imperial College, um, all the staff and students, all their support. Uh, we'll move on to uh, the Senior Commons room now, and from there on, we'll have a side two, probably. Uh, I think Chris. Yeah, I don't think thank you. Yeah, you, on the way here, you would have come past the very nice pilot plant uh, in the control room. So if you're interested in knowing more about what that does, the carbon capture pilot plant, and how we teach the students how to operate a realistic pilot plant, and a bit about safety, then hang around in the foyer outside that control room with me. And there's some students there in Colin who runs a pilot plant to explain it to you. Equally, if you just want to go and have a glass of wine and chat with your friends, then feel free to do that too. But we'll go down there now and wait with me if you'd like to know more about that in the foyer. So, thank you. Thank you.